All right, somebody help me out here. Let's see who remembers anything. Did I draw these graphs for you? No. no. You did. Uh, you did. I didn't draw them for you? No. Oh, well, this isn't review then. Sorry. <laughs> All right, which one of these represents supply? Which one represents demand was the question I was going to review. <laughs> Maybe we'll think about it. All right, down here, that's dollar. It's a dollar sign. So we have the price. And here's the, the amount of the product, whatever the product is. We talked about the interest rate being this basic thing or, um, or just the price of any, any product. So one of these, as the price goes higher, we see, uh, or you can, you can think about what happens to the amount produced as the price goes higher or goes lower, and probably can think w which one would be supply and which one would be demand. So uh, without, without thinking of the graphs, when the price is high, what happens to the demand, what happens to the supply? The demand goes down to the Okay, so we'd expect at some high point on the x coordinate, x, 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 x axis, um, that the, the y coordinate value would be low for demand, and the y coordinate value would be high for supply. So which one is which? Frank wants the answer. Should we just stick with that, <coughs> let the whole row answer maybe? Frank? The yeah, there'll be demand here. If we have a, a higher price, the demand is low. People want to buy less of it. And over here, let's not do gumballs. Uh, scrunchies? Scooch, what are those, those scrunchies? scrunchies? Those things you put in your hair to make ponytails with? <laughs> I live in a house with all girls. I, I've been corrupted, <laughs> unfortunately, yes. I mean, not, not personally, <laughs> but they're all over my house. You know, we pull the seat cushions up and they're there. They're, they're everywhere. All right, so scrunchies. If the price is really high, scrunchies? Scrunchies, yes. Scrunchies. Yeah. Rubber bands? <laughs> if the price is really high, then people buy less of them. So we have a high price, we buy less. But the, the producers, those evil hair care product people, when the price goes high, they begin to make a whole lot of them because there's profit there. Okay? So I thought that would be review. So, let's say that um, um, the government arbitrarily picks a price. Right? Just for, for sake of um, illustration, let's say that this point right about here is, the, is where the price would be, just left to the free market. Let's say the government steps in to uh, save the hair care industry from the uh, robber barons that have begun to dominate it. Wait, that would be, can women be robber barons? There's only the, <coughs> only the white men in the late 1800s. What's that? Oh, Baron. robber baronesses, there we go. All right, uh, to save the hair care industry, whatever industry you want to talk about. And they say for these scrunchies, you can't charge more than this. Scrunchies. Scrunchies? Scrunchies. I always thought there was no R there. I don't, I don't pay that much attention. They're, just, I, they're around. All right, so what's going to happen? How is this going to distort things? What's going to happen to the demand? And the supply. I'll put the chalk down so I don't break anymore. Somebody tell me. Just look at where the price is. What's going to happen? Demand goes up. Demand is, yeah. Demand is going to be pushed up to this point here. In my graphs, the scale is not accurate. But <laughs> demand is pushed up. More people are going to want to buy them because the price is lower. And the producers are going to be incentivized here to make less of them because they can only charge a certain amount. So they're going to cut back. Right? Um, sometimes... I mean, that, that's, don't, don't, they're not just, sometimes it'd be something like cutting, cutting out overtime. You know, if they're saying, well, we can only sell for this price and we can't afford to pay anybody overtime. So they, they trim all their shifts back so there's no overtime. They, they begin cutting back if there's not as much profit. If you're making a lot of profit, you can pay people overtime, make them work on Sundays and pay them double. You, you know, you, you can afford to do all that. But when the profit's gone, they begin to cut back. So a very natural uh, shrinkage there in the supply. 
And what's going to happen is if that point the government picks is below that natural market value, that uh, market claim price has got a lot of names, below that we're going to end up with a shortage. There'll be more people wanting to buy these things than people are willing to produce. Okay. At that point, liberal politicians will talk about, who wants to be the scrunchy baroness? <laughs> Amanda's cornered the, the gumball market, so we've got to. <laughs> Nobody's even got any in their hair. Come on, what's wrong with you girls? What? It's not a scrunchy. But it's, you got a, <laughs> you got a ponytail of some kind. You got something. Yeah, it's different. It's different. <coughs> See there? See how slippery she is? She's even. <laughs> so uh, so um, typically at this point, when the government creates this mess, which would, this is a mess the government created, they would talk about Sarah, who wherever the manufacturers are, is being greedy and not concerned about the populace and you know, wanting women to walk around with ugly hair. You know, it would, they would go down this road of, of all of these horrible things that the free market has caused. Okay? when it, it's, it's them, it's the government that has caused the problem. So liberals are very good at this. So they'll do something like this, it creates a very natural result. I mean, it could be predicted. And then they wanna step in and save us from the problem that they created, All right? And really the sane answer is, well, let's just get rid of that, that stupid mandated price and the free market will take care of it all by itself, so. I thought I was gonna review this for you, but obviously I didn't grow, draw the graphs for you, but yeah. Um. You would like that that is healthcare, right? The government's saying we're only going to pay this much mm -hmm. for certain... There are other factors involved, but a, a, a part of it is they are telling doctors and hospitals uh, if you have a plan covered by Obamacare, a plan that, that fits into that, that mold, there's only a certain amount that they're going to pay so, for certain procedures. Certain procedures. Certain doctors. So doctors say, I'm not going to mess with it. So They have a little bit of uh, confusion there because the actual consumer isn't paying anyway. It's the government, so it's insurance paying, so there's even a bigger disconnect, but that, that is a real, real life example where the, the supply is being cut back. I heard somebody once, an extremely uh, ignorant statement, somebody was saying, well, if we, if we have Obamacare and we start having restrictions like that, people are gonna quit entering the medical field. And the guy said, oh no, we, we, won't, we don't have that problem. We have plenty of doctors, we'll never have a shortage. They said, well, we're not like Canada. <laughs> They're forgetting the fact that if you strip out all that profit, then people aren't going to enter the field. There'll be a little bit of delay, but we're going to get to the point where there's, there's not enough doctors. And wow, where do we fly to? <laughs> Mexicans come, or I'm sorry, Canadians come here for, for better health care. I'm not sure where we'll have to go to uh, for better health care. Um, but anyway, it, it, it will create a shortage because fewer people will be willing to, to work for that pay. And it's not just because the doctors are greedy. Okay? That's not just it. Doctors are greedy, but so are patients. Right? So, and the free market recognizes that both are patient and lets them hash out a price that they're both willing to live with. So. Okay, supply and demand. A little bit of review, any questions on that? If you rank in your mind things that you, you know, 30 years from now you have to remember, first would be Mr. Reinhardt's great, but just below that, <laughs> I'm kidding. First, if you can understand Hazel's lesson, that'll, that'll, that'll put you on the right side of things. You know, when Bernie Sanders gets up and says free, free education for everybody and we're gonna forgive college debts, and, you know, you can, you, can, you can think through, well, that, how that's not going to work very good. The second thing I think would be understanding the basis of supply and demand. This is another kind of bedrock principles. It really gives you a more, you can, you can understand a little more sophisticatedly, if that's the right word. Uh, how to apply Hazel's lesson if you understand this. It's a, it's a, it's a very basic economic idea. Um, so there are complexities, um, but that's for economics class, not here. If that excites you, then join us next year. Amanda's with me? Oh yeah. Are you, are you an LN major? So, what is it? Missions. Missions. Oh, you'll need that on the mission fields. You know, when you're in a grass hut, you'll be explaining to people about the elasticity of demand. <laughs> so, all right, enough of that. Uh, somebody tell me, what is money? What is money? I don't know. I don't have any. <laughs> yeah, 
something accepted everywhere for anything or everything, either word is fine. There's just something that uh, one of the basic uh, uh, functions of money is to facilitate exchange. It makes it easier to, to buy and sell goods. All right, historically, all kinds of things have been used as money. Um, so we looked at some functions, some qualities, and we looked at, at our money today, which is only valuable because the government says it is. Um, quickly, uh, the Federal Reserve, what is one way that it manipulates the economy? Open market policy, that one. So, uh, the open market policy, buying and selling the bonds. Again, that one, <clears throat> to me, that's the one that I have to stop and slow my thinking down a little bit. You've got to follow where the cash is going. If they're wanting to, to make sure there's cash, more cash available to the people, then they're going to be buying bonds. The cash ends up with the people, not with in the government treasury. So, open market policy, what's another one? Talked about three. That one is the one that's used. Um, most often um, of the three. Reserve, Reserve requirement, that one is used very infrequently. It's not been used really for decades, but it is still a viable option. And the third one? Discount rate. Discount rate, that's the interest rate that banks are charged by the Federal Reserve. There are some, again, some, some details there that we're not worried about, but that's, that's an easy enough way to think of it. When the banks need a loan, that's the rate they're getting charged, that discount rate. And that has uh, been raised or lowered in, Raised and lowered, been lowered and lowered and lowered, and just barely ticked up a little bit recently. All right, uh, um, international trade. Why are we not worried about it? Because I don't buy things from overseas. <laughs> Sarah? Okay, yeah, all the people that talk about this balance of trade, they're not tracking the products, right? If you, if you factor the products in, there's no deficit, unless you're an idiot. And if you're an idiot, then we don't want you to have the money because you'll waste it. It puts it in the hands of the, the most efficient people, right? So, so really, if you, if you track the goods, not just the cash, there's no deficit. We, used, we talked about your, your relationship with a store, how you have this uh, trade deficit with the gas station. If you have a car, you don't complain about it. I mean, you're kind of happy that they sell you the gas, so. All right, talked about savings, talked about competition. Let's jump ahead to factors of production. This is where we were last time. Factors of production. <clears throat> this is kind of a broad uh, economic topic about just, you know, if we look at, at a country or society or a region and we, and we want to think about what, what things allow that region to be especially productive. Why is America different than the Soviet Union was? Or why is North Korea different from South Korea? What factors uh, are, are there that we're talking about? So the first one on the list is natural resources, just the, the raw material produced out of the ground. That has a very, um, I mean, the basic idea is very simple, but I once heard someone talking about, is a, a, a lecture about ecology and you know, man-made products ruining the environment and sticking with natural products, and, and he said, he posed the question, how would you define a product that's man-made versus one that's natural? You know, what, lumber, is that man-made? Or is it natural? <laughs> it really, you know, just about anything we use somehow is man-made. But anyway, this idea of natural resources, it's a basic idea. It's things that come directly out of the ground, something that, um, uh, what do you say, it can't be expanded or increased and it's not made by man. So, so natural resources, we, those are needed. And really the, the the difference in places that are impoverished today most of the time is not the fact that they don't have natural resources. Right? That, that isn't the, the key factor. So, All right, th the next thing is capital. They don't need to have a capital, they need capital. <clears throat> Let me give you just a basic definition. This one's not mine, this is from uh, Carson. But anyway, an economist or a historian. Uh, he, he defines capital this way, produced wealth used in further production. Anything that's used to further production. Amanda, in her gumball uh, empire, it sounds, it sounds bad if you call it that. Uh, this, what word would give it a, a nice connotation? In her gumball, there's not one. Charity. <laughs> so, 
All right, so let's, let's just use some easy numbers. Say she, she made uh, profit after she paid all her employees and paid for the buildings and paid for all the little bikes they ran over in the streets as they were racing to sell gumball. You know, paid all those expenses. All right, she's got $100,000 left over. If she takes 50,000 of that, goes on a nice cruise and other things with it, and saves 50,000 and puts it back into her company, that 50,000 would be considered capital. It's money that she's using to produce more things. If she just kept it for herself, it's profit, it's other things, but it's something that's being used to produce other things. All right, she could take that money and buy machines with it, buy, I was gonna say people, but that sounds bad, buy labor with it, <laughs> buy raw materials with it, other things. All right, so it doesn't have to be money, but it's, it's whatever, whatever's been saved up and used for production. All right, it could be the, the capital, her capital total invested in her company would be the buildings, the machines, the raw materials, the delivery trucks, the, the computer systems, the phone system, all of that would be capital. And she's using it for further production. If she's turning it and just wanting to live on it, she'd begin selling that stuff off and she'd be taking capital out of the company and using it personally. But it's, it's produced wealth, what's the phrase? Produced wealth used in further production, right? So we need, we need capital. Um, here, let me give you, I should look at my notes, uh, some, uh, some basic examples of things that are considered capital. All right, uh, tools, I should put there money. Tools, machines, vehicles, cars, trucks, etc. Buildings, computers, etc. Things like that. We need we need uh, those types of things. You know, if you're going to, um, if you didn't have your scrunchie production factory and you wanted to make one, right? <coughs> Either you've got to have a whole bunch of money saved that you're going to use as capital get that, to get that thing up and off the ground. Is that the case? You've got several hundred thousand dollars. I'm impressed. <laughs> and going to college. Is your school open? No. <laughs> and she's got to have her own capital that she can use for this thing, or other people in society have to have money they save that can be turned into capital to produce this thing. So that's, uh, if you've ever heard the phrase, it takes money to make money, there is some real truth to that. I mean, she's got to, before she can sell any of her hair things, she's got to build the factory, she's got to get the equipment, she's got to hire employees, she's got to buy the raw materials to make the hair thingies out of. Um, all that money has to be put out up front. And someplace there's capital. It might be the, the raw producer, the p people make, giving her the raw materials. They'll say, all right, we'll loan you the money and we'll just give you the products and you pay us in the end. But somehow there's gotta be that, that stored wealth to produce things, all right, so capital. Um, that is required. All right, the next one is labor. I should back up and mention, this is the classic four categories that economists split all of this up into. This is not just, just my, designation. This is the, the usual way. So I, I don't disagree with it, but it is the usual. And what is the sum? I'm sorry. Uh, that's the third <coughs> category of factors of production. <coughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Natural resources, capital, labor. Labor. <coughs> All right, this would be you know, the actual human labor put into it. Um, historically, and even to this day, really, uh, lots of labor is the, the most important factor. I mean, you could have, a, you could have a, a factory full of machines, but if you don't have the right people that are working them, you've got a problem. I think I've talked about my uncles that owned a machine shop. Um, they were offering, this is probably 10 years ago, $50,000 a year with a full benefits package. Uh, to run a machine. I mean, it's, they had some really neat machines. Some of you guys would, would like to tour the shop. It was fascinating. But they were having trouble getting people to come and work. I mean, this is in rural West Virginia where you could, you know, buy a house for $20,000, you know, and very, very low living expenses. And they, they were having trouble getting enough people to come and work, getting the right labor in, right? And so, so it is extremely important having the right workforce in there. So uh, labor, a couple of comments about that. Uh, beyond that, uh, free labor is more productive than slave labor. Right? I mean, there have been times in the world, think of the Soviet Union and other places, or the, you know, the, the Hebrews in Egypt, or the slaves in, South, in the South, uh, where there's been slave labor. That labor is not nearly as productive as the labor of a free people working for a profit. That profit motive, the same thing that drives Amanda and Sarah 
uh, to dominate their particular industries <laughs> causes you to work hard. You want a, you want a better paycheck. If you're ever thinking, I, I just, nobody wants to hire me, I can't get a job, you might want to think about that. Right? That is a major factor. Um, I know a guy that's, I might have mentioned it, making $50 an hour, over 50 an hour, never graduate from high school. Okay? But he's a very good worker. He runs a, runs a very interesting machine, drilling gigantic holes deep into the ground. Um, he builds a foundation for skyscrapers, among other things. So. But anyway, the, the difference is he's a hard worker. His boss at some point said, I know you never graduated from high school, but I don't care. <laughs> uh, you can do a very good job. And now he's got a, uh, the boss gave him a um, Dodge, I forget the, you know, it's one of those king cab pickup trucks with the diesel tank on the back to, to it's, it's, it's a very nice truck that the boss gave him to, to drive back and forth with. So anyway, the point is, he's a good worker, okay? And, and employees are, are willing to pay for a good worker. Um, so anyway, free labor is much more important, much more productive than uh, slave labor. Another, another thought here uh, with labor is that uh, for Christians, being a hard worker is really part of our duty to God. We look at it not, uh, we don't look at labor as some, you know, menial task that's below us. It's something that God talks about and encourages. And it isn't just coincidence. If you look through uh, world history, the countries that have been most affected by Christianity are the more prosperous. You know, if you think of, think of England and America as opposed to the Soviet Union or something where they actively rejected Christianity or North Korea as opposed to South Korea. So anyway, we look at it as a Part of our duty to God, uh, this hard, hard work. Proverbs has lots of verses here, it's just a couple. He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Right? Talking about labor. Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. All right, so that idea of labor, it's, it's, a, um, it's something that we as Christians, we view as our, part of our duty to God. So, All right, uh, last uh, comment about labor is that this includes more than just physical labor. It would also include mental labor. In this sense here, I would just be a laborer in the college. I'm just slaving away, serving my taskmaster, Dr. Vogelin, and Pastor Dameron, and Pastor Armacost. Never give me a break. I'm kidding. But it includes mental, mental work, not just physical work, as included here in this, this category of labor and these uh, factors of production. All right, the last one, and the one that, that might be the, the, the most difficult to fully grasp, but it's not too difficult, is management or uh, entrepreneurship. Management or entrepreneurship. Uh, the, the guy, in our, we've got to get some guys to have some businesses in here. We've got two girls running businesses. That's sad. What's wrong with you guys? What's that? We own the bank and they owe us money. <laughs> so you're the evil banker. <laughs> we have a corrupt class. We've got robber baronesses and evil bankers. And Jacob kind of fits the part. <laughs> so. All right, but anyway, the, the, the owner, the manager of a company, that, that is a uh, significant thing. Uh, I have this as a little definition. The people are willing to go out and take the risk. You know, Sarah's got this great idea. She's figured out a better way to make scrunchies, some new product or some whatever. Um, it's got to go somehow from an idea in her mind <coughs> to there being a factory and there being workers and there being policies and there being products and there being some distribution network to... You know, it doesn't help if they just have this nice machine making all these great products and they just have this um, um, conveyor belt running out the side of the plant and they have all those big piles of scrunchies. You know, like the, like the state does salt or something, just piles it up. Yes, we're, <laughs> we're producing better things than anyone else in the world. It doesn't help any. You've got to somehow get that stuff to market. So that the, the person that is able to do that, it really is a very, very special um, it, it's a, it is a talent. We can look at somebody and say, wow, they're really tall or they're really strong or they're really good at math or um, they, um, they have the colors of the color wheel down and can, can 
design interior things and make them look nice, whatever. You can talk about different people and different, different characteristics. This is another one, though, somebody who can manage something very, very well. Um, I used to work for a concrete company <clears throat> in, in high school in, in my first couple years of college in the summer times. If you ever want to do something that will cause you to want to come back and get back into school, do concrete all summer. That's, <laughs> I was ready for school. <laughs> um, but my, my boss worked right with us. He had one crew, he was the owner, he was there on all the jobs. It's a gigantic leap to go from that to managing an organization. We got multiple crews and multiple trucks and you know, all, all that, that whole operation. It's a whole other ball game uh, to, to do that. And that is a, a talent. Lots of small business owners, uh, some of them don't want the headache to go that route, but they, they never make that leap from them personally doing all the work to being able to manage and get other people to come and do the work and, and effectively do that. And large companies that, that have been successful at that, uh, they, they usually have somebody, somebody very unique at their head. Um, and I just listened to a book about um, Milton Hershey. You know, I mean, chocolate, I thought, what's the big deal? He just made chocolate bars and his, his name stuck. Um, Megan's awake. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so. But, but he, was, uh, he, he struggled and struggled and, and bought equipment from Europe. And you know, he, for, for months, was uh, personally him and some other guys working on the formula to get their chocolate just right. And you know, he had this vision. I forget what he said, a five cent chocolate bar or something? That was his. <laughs> it's a good thing, Megan, they cost more. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, excited she got all of a sudden. You could be talking about Christ's death or something, but that kind of blows over. But chocolate, and all of a sudden her eyes light up. Uh, <laughs> so, um, what was I saying? But he had to go from this dream of I can, I, can make a chocolate, I can make chocolate better than anyone else in the country at a better price than them. And he had to take that, and he was, I don't know, 20, 21, had no capital. So he's going to relatives. You know, begging them, you know, please, I've got this great idea, trust me. You, know, you can imagine what the relatives thought. Going to other people, uh, trying to get this thing off the ground. But now we look back at him and we say, wow, what, what a great businessman. Who wouldn't have trusted him? He, he, he had to get that off the ground. I mean, it, it, it took something. So that ability, all right, that is, that is really, it's a talent. And it's not something everybody has. And to be able to, he started out um, uh, initially making caramel. And uh, he would make caramel at night and run around like a mad dog during the day trying to sell it and go back at night and make more for the next day. And you know, that, that completely floundered because he, he, couldn't, he couldn't do both. So eventually he learns how to, to expand this thing and he gets to the point where, if you've ever been to Hershey Park in Pennsylvania, he, he builds his own town and has all the workers come and live in his town. Uh, it's, you know, he, he personally built it, designed it. Uh, he did the same thing when I was, read his biography in, in Cuba and a couple of different places. He had trouble getting a consistent supply of sugar, which meant he was making a lot of chocolate. <laughs> so he thought, well, I'm gonna, I'll just go buy the, the sugar plantation. So he buys the sugar plantations and does the same types of thing down there. You know, uh, hires workers, builds little, um, little cities down there. He also made himself his own little personal villa. You know, when you're there observing, you have to be comfortable. He was a rich man. But the point is, the, the vision to put that together, that's a very special thing. Or you might have heard in... Um, and uh, the Sunday school story about the orange juice guy. Um, Tropicana. Is it Tropicana? Yeah. I can't remember. The little Rascal or something like that? Yes. Yes. All right, the guy who's in New York, and he, he has this idea of, of uh, shipping oranges up to sell it from, from wherever. You know, the, the whole Tropicana orange juice thing it was his idea. Uh, a brand new idea of having these fresh oranges and fresh squeeze and all that it was, a, it was a new thing. So anyway, that, that uh, entrepreneurship is something real and it's, a, it's um, very different than just being a hard worker. All right, very, very different things. So. And there's just a, a plethora of examples from the robber barons. All right, there's a reason why, why um, Rockefeller dominated the, the oil production industry. <laughs> He's very good at it. To, uh, to more recent ones like Apple and uh, Windows and some of those types of things. I heard Windows 10 this morning is the fastest selling Windows operating system. I have no idea. Uh, what's that? I don't know. 
Uh, but anyway, th to that, I mean, how do you, how do you go from uh, before, before personal computers, I mean, you had these gigantic mainframe computers and you had to use them uh, you know, using um, basic or uh, what's the other programming language? Anyway, you had, to, you had to know programming. And this guy says, well, let's, let's make a personal computer. And people thought, this is stupid. I mean, well, who's going to want a computer in their house? <laughs> okay, and obviously they, they managed to pull that thing off, and now we don't just have computers in our house. We carry some of you multiple computers on your body at any given time, your phone and your laptop and other things. So, All right, so that, that entrepreneurship, that management, that is a significant uh, factor. And when you hear people like Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton talking about these evil... Uh, evil people that have made money in business. They're talking about those people, all right? Um, the, the people that, that take some idea and actually put some flesh to it and make it a product that people are willing to buy. And for everyone that succeeds, there's dozens and dozens that fail. Right? It, is, it is not without risk. <laughs> all right, questions about factors of production. Again, not just a a classic list of the four main categories if, if we need to have a country that is productive. We need all four of those to be there. So. Oh, talking about classic economics. Let's talk about Adam oh. Smith. <laughs> all right, we got uh, Adam Smith and then personal finances. Oh, and then, oh yeah. Well, I just want to try to get that far. Uh, before preaching conference. Adam Smith today, personal finances on Friday, and then uh, hopefully tie that thing up. All right, Adam Smith. First point I have is a little bit of introduction, and then the second point I have is points he made in his book. <laughs> so, uh, A through F, different points, <coughs> points he made, things he taught in his book. All right, anybody, uh, introduction. First thing is the, the book he's famous for writing, published in 1776. Wealth of Nations, do you know the full title? I don't know if I know it offhand. An inquiry into the causes and something, something of the Wealth of Nations. The Wealth of Nations is sufficient. I think it was the fad back then to try to have the longest title. I don't know, I'm sure maybe in search engines it came up quicker or something. There's some reason for it. <laughs> uh, the Wealth of Nations, published in 1776. Um, this dealt with what at, at this time was at the time of his life was called political economy. We would just call it economics today, but it was referred to as political economy. And it undermined, this book undermined mercantilism. That was the, the and in undermining mercantilism, it taught a free market system. So it was pointing out the foolishness of mercantilism. And at the same time, by pointing out the, the errors of mercantilism, was teaching a free market system. All right, anybody remember anything about mercantilism? Other than thinking that was the economic system that was strangling England, and uh, it almost strangled me, and I'm glad to be away from it. <laughs> anything at all about mercantilism? In American history, I, I tried to, uh, there was one phrase that I said, if you forget everything else, remember when you think mercantilism, think something, and obviously nobody remembers. Yes. Yes. I have political control of the economy. That's what you should think of. It's, it's the government controlling the economy. Okay. Uh, we, st we have that today, but the, the, the goal that the government's getting to is different today than it was back then. Government control. That, that is what you should think of. All right. at, at that point, mercantilism, the government was trying to enrich the mother country. That's why you saw them pushing to have colonies and having all the crazy tra trade regulations with the colonies or trying to funnel the money back to the mother country, uh, they, the, the, the idea of a trade deficit started at this point of these, uh, they, they, they were only tracking the, the gold back and forth. They're trying to get the gold in the mother country, so they were tracking the trade deficit. So it was, it was political control, and he was undermining that whole idea, and in doing that, uh, taught the free market system. So last thing, if you want, uh, the years of his life, he's from 1723 is when he was born to 1790. Uh, Went to college, several different places, eventually uh, became a professor at several different places. All right, so Adam Smith. <clears throat> All right, now the real point I want to make is uh, looking at some things he taught in his book. I really do have A through F here. 
uh, points he made in his book. All right, the first is kind of a general uh, observation about how he wrote. Um, First thing is he argued from a position of natural law and natural rights. It was really almost synonymous, but not, not exactly. Wrote from a position of natural law and natural rights. He didn't just... He wasn't pulling out the British you know, Magna Carta and documents and saying, look, according to this, the government shouldn't be doing it. He wasn't doing that. He was, he was starting with the fact that we're created by God and God put order in the universe and we can observe uh, what works, much like we can look at nature and observe and uh, see what works and what doesn't. We can do the same thing here with the way humans interact. So natural law and natural rights. Let me very quickly give you a, a short uh, thought about natural law and natural rights that he points out. All right, uh, the first is natural law. This is uh, a, natural, uh, um, a natural order uh, uh, that uh, men are governed by. Just, you know, <clears throat> you put people together without government involved at all. There'll be natural ways that they interact. Um, a big part of this, he didn't make this point here necessarily, but we've talked before about uh, uh, self-interest. You know, you're going to... Uh, uh, even the Tropicana guy who you know, would tell a story in Sunday school, he wanted to make money. <laughs> okay, it was his self-interest uh, that caused him to do that. So anyway, he said there's this natural law, natural way that people operate, and the government should recognize that. If the government makes laws that go contrary to that natural law, there's going to be a problem. Just like if the government made some law that went contrary to the laws of nature, there's going to be problems. You know, imagine if um, the government dictated... Um, in the interest, let's see if I can make it sound good, in a, in a desire to encourage renewable resources, we hereby dictate that uh, solar panels work on cloudy days. Okay. Are solar panels gonna work on cloudy days? What if they make it a requirement for us to put solar panels up and disconnect from the power grid so we don't further use fossil fuels to pollute the world and kill the monkeys? And the it might taste good, though. I never tried. So, uh, <laughs> It's not going to change the fact that it's cloudy and the solar panels don't work. It's just going to create a big mess. Okay? The same thing is true. There's a natural way we interact and you know, respond to things. And if the government doesn't recognize that when it makes laws about how we're governed, it's going to create a big mess. I mean, a big factor there is we're sinners. Um, we're going to be interested in, in benefiting ourselves. If the government doesn't recognize things like that as it makes laws, there's going to be a big mess. And that really is uh, socialism and other things don't, don't start from that position of, of God made us. And there's a, a natural order, a natural law there. So, all right, so that was one facet, this natural law side of things. It is mocked and made fun of by liberals today. Um, 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 the justice that just died. Wow. Scalia. He, he very strongly believed in natural law, and people thought this is some antiquated idea from the 1700s. Come on, it's like, you think there's a flat earth too or something? It's, it's made fun of, but really it's a, it's a very right idea. So, all right, the second piece there was all natural rights, and that's just basically there are certain rights that we have from God. I mean, that's certain things that the, the government really isn't at liberty to do to us or for us, as liberals would say. Uh, there's certain rights we have from God. Anybody know a, a, a document that we're familiar with that recognizes rights from God? Christina's smiling. Hopefully it's because she knows. She's thinking, oh, you stupid people. I took the easy question. <laughs> what document talks about being endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights? Declaration of Independence, okay, that, that's recognized in our founding documents. That is one of the reasons why liberals hate those founding documents so much. Right? They only reference them when they want to claim that somehow a right to an abortion is one of those God-given rights. Right? That's hard to, <laughs> or the right to um, right for two guys to get married is some God-given right. It, it, the only reference is for that type of perversion. But it is a true thought here. We have these rights that are from God. It's really not the government's job to uh, meddle or, or take those away at all. So he, he argues from that position. He doesn't just go to the, the English law books and talk about how mercantilism is violating these principles of English law. He starts with, we're created by God, and there's a natural law and, and, and natural rights that, that govern, 
govern the world. So, all right, that's the first one. Argued from the position of natural law and natural rights. Uh, second thing is he felt that the government only had three duties according to this idea of natural law. Three duties. <clears throat> This is the second point he made. Sorry. Yeah, B. He argued from the position of natural rights and natural law. The second thing is he felt that government only had three duties. All right. I'll read you some quotes from his book. But the first one is to protect the people inside the country from foreign violence and invasion from other countries. All right. He says, first, the duty of protecting the society from the violence and invasion of other independent countries. And so that was the first job the government should have. Secondly, the duty of protecting every member of society from injustice or oppression of every member of it. So to protect us from crime and fraud within the country. You know, when, uh, when the other Sarah with the H starts to sell a combo uh, scunchy gumball package so you can chomp on gum while you do your hair or something. I'm sure there's some marketing trick there. Uh, <laughs> forget it. All right, uh, the other two here, um, if they start coming after her and you know, start intimidating her workers and you know, catching her delivery trucks and slicing their tires, and, um, the government should stop that type of thing, okay? And the same if the other two uh, robber baronesses start to defraud people and uh, you know, Amanda says, yeah, here's, here's my uh, 10 ounce package of gumballs. There'd probably be a lot of gumballs, but <laughs> my 10 ounce package of gumballs and it's really eight ounces and she's defrauding people, right? The government should be there to stop, but she is pretty evil and that's... What evil can't stop? Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> said my evil can't stop. You can't, I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> So, all right, so the point is protect, protect us from each other. Crime would be the, what we think of there, protect us from crime. And then the third, uh, the duty of erecting and maintaining certain public works and certain public institutions. Right? Basically, uh, maintain a framework to have an orderly society, something to that effect. Duty of erecting certain public works, you know, forts, buildings for uh, the legislature to meet, police stations, that type of stuff, and certain public institutions, a police force, military force, Etc. Now that third one, you know, it is a little bit vague. Well, which which certain ones are we talking about? But he's talking from the idea of, of natural law and natural rights. So we're not going to get to some crazy things like we have today. All right. If you think what we talked about uh, earlier, the the rights or the duties of government from the Bible, protect us from evil. That'd be the first two points, and then we'll reward the good. That would fit mostly with that third point. Right. So again, not that he was. Uh, trying to write a book about biblical economics, but at least does line up. Okay, so he argued those are the duties of government, those three things. You don't have anything there about uh, enriching the mother country or meddling with the economy. Or, you know, none of that's there. It's not the government's job to do any of that. So. All right, uh, the third point that we'll talk about that he made is that he, he taught that people pursuing their own self-interest uh, would bring about the most benefit for society at large. Liberals want to talk about, you know, we need to orchestrate this for the good of the whole people. You know, we've got a, we need this government program. We've got to, I don't know, I always think of crazy Bernie, free, free college tuition and then wiping out the debts of others who, <laughs> who've had, had a, you know, were in debt beforehand. Um, for the good of the whole society, they argue that type of thing. And he's saying the way to do the most good is to allow people to pursue their own self-interest. That will do more good for all of society than, than some organized government program. Let me give you a quote or read a quote to you from his book. Uh, Every individual is continually exerting himself to find out the most advantageous employment for whatever capital he can command. Anybody recognize the term there, capital? So, for whatever capital he can command. It is his own advantage, indeed, and not of society, which he has in view. But the study of his own advantage naturally, or rather necessarily, leads him to prefer that employment which is most advantageous to the society. Right? The fact that, that you want to sell a product that makes money so you can have money is going to cause you to find a product that you can sell <laughs> to everybody else. Right? He's saying that people pursuing their own self-interest is going to produce the most good for society. Okay, now that's kind of vague and abstract, 
Uh, but, but let's boil it down to um, know, Olivia needs to get her ears checked. All right, so we're going to take her to the ear doctor at some point. That ear doctor, unless she's really weird, um, and even if he claimed this, I don't think it would be true. He's not there just because he loves mankind. I want to make sure that they can hear clearly so they can hear the birds chirping in the trees and the wind rustling the leaves, the dry leaves in the fall across the yard. <laughs> Look back, any word for me. Right. That doctor isn't there to just serve mankind. Right. That doctor is there because he wants to make money. Okay, and the doctor there at some point, might not have thought through this explicitly, but was thinking, if I become an ear doctor, that'll be the way that I can make money. I've got to pro provide something that other people are willing to pay for, for me to make money. Okay? And some ear doctor is probably going to get some of my money. It kind of stinks. This evil. No, they're not evil. <clears throat> they're, by allowing them to pursue their own self-interests, it's providing me with something useful and I'm willing to pay for it. And that's the point he's making. People pursuing their own self-interest will provide the most good for society. Think of pretty much any industry you want to think about, everything from, from Apple to uh, the audiology industry, is that what it is, hearing? To, I don't know, auto mechanics, building trades, airlines, uh, FedEx. At the heart of it, they're, <clears throat> they're trying to provide some product or service that people are willing to pay for. And they're not providing that product or service just because they love mankind. You know, FedEx isn't there just to make sure everybody gets their Christmas presents from grandma before Christmas. <laughs> they're there because they want to make money off of grandma, but when she doesn't send them on time, <laughs> then charge her extra money. All right, uh, but it's, it's that self-interest. And the point he makes is that allowing people to pursue their own self-interest will produce the most good for society. We talked about that before as one of the complaints about the free market and people are going to, you know, it's wrong to take advantage of other people's problems or that type of thing. No, no. A free market, the fact that they're making money, ensures that there's somebody there. If we go the route that Obama wants to go with health care, there's not going to be an ear doctor that's hoping my daughter has a problem with her ears and I come to him with my money. There's going to be some government doctor who's getting paid by the government, and he doesn't care if my daughter comes or not because he's getting paid regardless of whether or not my daughter comes. <laughs> his, 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 uh, him having to provide me with a service to make money is gone. All right, and that he's getting paid either way. All right, so anyway, the point there is uh, people pursuing their own self-interest will bring about the most benefit to society at large. All right, fourth point. <clears throat> fourth point. He taught that rulers, I better get done with this. He taught that rulers do not have the ability to adequate, adequate, adequately govern the economy. And it would be dangerous if they had that power. <laughs> it, it, it makes a point that it's not that they're stupid or incompetent, although I think we have some of that. Um, not that they're stupid or incompetent. Even if we had some process where we can get the most competent person in the country, that may be in a real life situation, you know, the person who's able to make the most money. It gives us Donald Trump, that's scary. Uh, <laughs> you know, if we, even if we could get the most qualified person to be our leader and give them this power to organize society, it's, it's beyond their grasp to do. It just, it's not possible, okay? Uh, he didn't use this example, but I, I think we've referenced it before, that the article uh, called Rinconomics, about trying to have some central agency control everybody roller skating. Talk about fun. You know, juju, slow down and turn left. <laughs> and you can think, well, well what if we had, uh, you know, instead of one person, we have this, some sort of group of people and they can do it. And what if we, and you can keep expanding it. What if we had one person, uh, every skater has one person directing them. And, you know, you could, it's just not going to work. Right? It's not practical. And that's the point he's making. If we try to set up a government to organize society for this public good, whatever that is, uh, it's not possible. It's just it's, they don't have the capacity to do it. It doesn't work. So it makes that point. All right, the fourth thing, or a, a, a fifth thing he talks about is division of labor. We referenced this when we talked about international trade. Uh, one of the uh, benefits of international trade is it allows for an increase in division of labor there. I think we talked about the Colombians uh, and their agricultural prowess with certain things that they want to sell us, some legal and some not legal. Uh, 
I just heard the libertarian candidate for president, or the guy who's hoping to be the libertarian candidate for president. They're, they're still having their conventions uh, advocating making marijuana legal all across the United States. Think of all these people in jail for marijuana. It's just, let's get rid of this whole thing. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, there, I mentioned that the division of labor, international trade allows for an increase in this division of labor. Anyway, uh, Smith here teaches that division of labor allows us to be more productive. Right? Um, if you uh, ever really wanted to uh, live completely independent from everybody else, be ready to work like a dog, okay? <laughs> and really, if you're, gonna, if you're not going to use any electricity from the, the power grid, uh, you're not going to buy anything from the store, you're going to make your own shoes, make your own tools, um, you know, grow your own food, raise your own cattle, and then shoot them and slaughter them, you know, just do everything. Make your own bullets to shoot, and you have to make your own gun. <laughs> Really, it, it is <clears throat> extremely difficult to do all that yourself, all right? And there's, there's a reason why people that, that live in that status work nonstop all day and barely get ahead, you know, because they're, they're, it's so inefficient, all right? Division of labor allows us to be much, much more efficient. He, he lists uh, three things here, three points about how uh, division of labor allows us to be more efficient. Uh, first is the skill of the workman at one particular job increases. If you, um, if you somehow manage to be the, um, oh, I just lost a particular, I don't know, Milton Hershey's chocolate taste tester. <laughs> You're going to have really refined taste buds, and you can pick out good chocolate from bad chocolate. There you go, Megan. You can, make, you can no, 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 volunteer. Ask to get paid. <laughs> we want to get paid for this. <laughs> all right. So, but when we have people whose job is to just taste stuff all day. You know, they eat different products. You know, sounds good, depending on what you're tasting. Um, but, um, and there's people who all they do is make cabinets. You know, all they do is repair computers. It gives you an ability to refine your skills at that particular job, as opposed to having to make your own cabinets and then repair your own car and, you know, and doing all this stuff yourself. You can hone in on one particular thing. So it so allows for the skill of the workman to increase. Second thing he points out is that there's no time lost in uh, changing from job to job. I think I mentioned that slaughtering house that my friend worked out and I went to college with, where he sliced out one piece of meat all day. Right. The other option is to have every workman, this is the way it's done before uh, Ford revolutionized the whole world with his assembly line process. Um, uh, before, uh, before that'd be this, you know, the worker <clears throat> goes out to the yard, drags his particular cow into his workstation, kills it, hangs it up, skins it, does the whole thing all by himself. And he's, he's continually switching tools, uh, all kinds of different jobs involved there. That's much less efficient than having a whole bunch of employees all doing one particular job. You can, you can, those cows just go zipping through there. And that'd be a fun time lapse picture of the cow getting shot, and as it goes down the assembly line, it just, <laughs> just <laughs> shrivels down. <laughs> just look, just some bones, and they throw those in the dog pile or something. Um, but <laughs> Point is, is there's not time lost switching between jobs and workstations. So, um, <clears throat> cars were made like that originally. You you would you would assemble your own car. You did it all yourself. All right, and that really is what, what the, that assembly line revolutionized that whole thing. So, all right, and then the third thing <clears throat> is it encourages the invention of new tools. As you focus on one particular job, it helps you think of tools that would be better. He gives an interesting example that I could see at least us boys doing here. He uh, says on the fire engine, this would be in the late 1700s, uh, they used to have to keep a, he says a boy, at a certain point uh, to uh, move a lever back and forth with the, with the steam boiler and all that kind of stuff, you know, the, the, to make everything work right. Uh, it's a boy sitting there doing this thing, he eventually realized that if he tied a string from the lever he has to move to another piece of the machinery, that the two always move together. And eventually the boy just tied those two together and sat there and enjoyed his life. And eventually the boss realized that and he lost his job. <laughs> uh, but but he, he, he figured out a better way to do it, a new piece of equipment that completely, in this case, eliminated his job. 
but he really, he wanted to go play anyway. He was a boy. Uh, but anyway, he uses that example of this invention of new tools. As you focus on one particular job, you, you think of new tools or maybe new, new methods of doing things that improve things. Okay, division of labor. Um, uh, those are uh, ways that it makes us more productive. There's a couple other points um, uh, he uh, makes about division of labor. Let me, let me give you those. <clears throat> the next point about division of labor, he says that as people trade, uh, the division of labor naturally occurs. Just, we don't... Well, I shouldn't even say this because they might, they might hear. We don't need the government agencies to, you know, the division of labor agency or something like that to <laughs> figure out, well, just how should we split up the auto repair industry? Should we have, you know, only shops that do alignments and shops that only do engine work and shops that only do electrical work? And if you have, if you get in a wreck and you need your car aligned and something repaired on the engine and the electrical system done, then you know, you've got to take it to three step. Do we really need the government to, to do that for us? No, he's saying this is a natural product. As, <clears throat> as people trade and barter back and forth, and as we get money, it allows that to even be easier. This division of labor is a very natural thing. We don't need the, the government to do it. Um, okay, and then the last point that we'll talk about that he makes with division of labor, we got it, uh, is that it's limited by the market. Division of labor is limited by the market. If there's not enough people in your community to have uh, a uh, grandfather clock repairman, then you're not going to be able to have that as your particular job. <laughs> but if you live in a large enough community, it's possible. I mean, you might, there are shops in Chicago that just sell clocks, right? Because they have a very large market there. So it's, it's limited by the market. Uh, back in the late 1800s, he says the advent of uh, fast transportation has made the market bigger, right? You know, when you, when you can drive to Chicago in an hour, it effectively extends that market. And that this would extend even to with international trade, which effectively doing there is making the market bigger and it allows for a natural increase or refinement in the division of labor. All right, last thing for Smith here, uh, number, number letter F, some points he made in his book. This isn't all the points in his book. If you've ever seen the book, you would know that this is not possibly all of them because it's gigantic. All right, uh, number, or sorry, letter F is uh, he gives a formula for a nation to become wealthy. That might make sense thinking of the title of the book, uh, The Wealth of Nations. Three things. Private ownership of property. That would really be one of those natural rights from God that he starts out arguing about. Private ownership of property. That is something we're used to. Um, but it is, it is extremely important. Right? Um, maybe I shouldn't. This might not be the best example. Think about how you treat the dorm as opposed to how your parents treat their house. The dorm is it's not your private property. Right? You don't, uh, your, your parents very likely on their own go out and uh, buy stuff to fix their house up. But in your dorm room, you don't say, oh, you know, the, the, the slides on my drawers are bad. Let me run to Menards and buy new ones and put them on. <laughs> You're not going to do that by yourself. You might tell Mr. Schrock and let the school buy them for you, but it's not your private property. So that private property is vital here. So private property. The second one is division of labor. We just talked about. He referred to it sometimes as specialized production, but that division of labor. <clears throat> and then the last one is a free market. A free market. That, he says, was the formula for a nation to become wealthy. So. All right, Adam Smith, a, a eminently significant historical figure writing about political economy. So. All right, any questions? Friday, we'll talk about your personal finances, so... Bring your checkbooks. Bring your smartphone so you can pull up your account. <laughs> Anybody have a checkbook? A couple of you? Okay. Do you know where it is? Okay. <laughs> All right, see you then.